congratulations on reality show. Thank you, thank you. I've uh, watched the trailer a, a good few times, and actually, it makes me uh, obviously um, I can't watch it when it <laughs> at the moment when it uh, airs on on TV over there. Uh, so I'm just gonna have to have to sit it out and, and wait until until the UK are uh, airing. It'll be there. It'll be there. Soon enough. <laughs> uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you. So I'm starting from the, the beginning um, for the benefit of, of readers who may not yet be familiar with the show. Uh, what is reality reality show about? Uh, reality show is a a very dark satire about the world of reality television, and it follows um, a reality show producer named Mickey Wagner. I actually play, uh, and Mickey Wagner has a, what he believes is a brilliant idea to reinvent reality television. He's going to reboot reality. Um, he knows better than anybody that reality shows are all fake. They're all staged. Everything in them is written by writers and producers, and he knows because he's produced tons of successful reality shows. But he's sick of how phony they are. And he wants to produce a reality show now that is genuinely real. He wants to uh, throw all the, uh, the idea of everything being contrived out the window, and he wants to photograph real life. He feels that that would be revolutionary, that reality television actually reflects reality. And the way he's going to do that, he's going to pick an all-American family, and he's going to put them under all-encompassing surveillance without their knowledge. He's going to hide cameras all over their house. He's going to hide cameras all over their cars and all over their work. He's going to follow them everywhere they go with a team of surveillance experts filming them from, uh, you know, cars and long lens cameras and hat cams and glasses cams. Everything they do is going to be captured. And he feels that not being aware that there's a camera in their face and not knowing that they're the subjects of a show, um, that that will elicit... Um, a much more compelling product that um, real the, the, the real life human drama that emerges will be far more fascinating than anything a team of Hollywood writers and producers could cook up. Uh, unfortunately, he finds out very quickly that they're boring. <laughs> this is exactly why reality shows are manipulated because people just aren't as dramatic as they need to be week after week. Yeah. So he, he little by little starts to betray his own conceit and starts to inject conflict into their lives just to spice up the show a little bit. And every little bit keeps working, so he keeps pushing it more and more and more. Now, the people have no idea why all this bad luck seems to be befalling them out of nowhere. Um, but Mickey Wagner is thrilled because the show keeps getting better and better the more um, conflict he throws in their paths. Uh, and it starts to get very dark as the family starts to spiral uh, out of control. And uh, Mickey Wagner's rationalization, of course, is that no matter how bad it gets, and it gets pretty bad, that all will be forgiven in the end, because once the episodes start airing, and these people are rich and famous, that fame will heal all wounds. Now, this uh, isn't your first project that is based around surveillance. Um, because a couple of years ago, you had your series Look, um, which also aired on Showtime, and before that, your film uh, of the same name. And uh, I guess even going back to Welcome to Hollywood, actually, to a degree, um, you know, that, that whole kind of documentary aspect. Um, so what is it about surveillance and the documenting of lives that interests you so much? Well, I just find the idea... Especially with Look and Look the series, they find the idea that people are being watched without their knowledge fascinating. We're all voyeurs, especially now more than ever. You know, the internet has basically just embraced our inner voyeuristic tendencies. And yeah. uh, it's just exploded with everybody. Everybody's a voyeur, and to a certain degree, you know, most people seem to be exhibitionists as well. I mean, they, in addition to all the surveillance that's going on, and obviously you guys know more about surveillance than anybody, London being the most surveyed city in the world. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, this awareness that everything is being photographed, people's behavior has changed to to be, you know, very exhibitionistic for these cameras as well. Thus, you know, all the sexting that's occurring and all the, you know, voluntary 
military surveillance people put themselves under when they tweet every single thing that they're up to every day and Facebook every single picture of themselves doing something embarrassing or funny or heinous. So, you know, I feel that it's, it's, it's a part of the zeitgeist right now. With Look, first with the movie, I really got interested in the idea that uh, everybody is caught by so many surveillance cameras every day. In America, it's about 300 times a day. I know in London, it's many, many more than that. And uh, I thought, well, what if somebody had access to all the footage, that, uh, uh, you know, all the surveillance footage, and what if, you know, uh, uh, your, your, the story of your life could unfold just from a culmination of all these surveillance cameras? And that's how Look came about. I, I actually got a, a red light ticket from a red light camera here in Los Angeles. And they send you the ticket along with the photograph of yourself running the light. And I thought it was very intrusive. And uh, I started to think, well, what other cameras are catching me that I'm not thinking about with, without my knowledge? And I just started paying attention. And everywhere I went, there was cameras everywhere. I mean, everywhere I went. And then I did a little research, and I learned that, you know, the average American, about 300 times a day. And I thought, well, wow, that could be an interesting way to tell a story. If, if, if I just told the story from the point of view of the surveillance footage, it could be interesting. Um, the movie looked did really well, won a bunch of awards, played the art house circuit very successfully. Uh, and then that spawned Look the Series. And Look the Series, as well, was all shot from surveillance cameras. But look, the series took it to the next level and also included social media and, you know, the camera in everybody's pocket in their phone and Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and all the self-surveillance that's going on. So, so whereas look, the movie was mostly Big Brother, um, look, the series was very much a combination of Big Brother and Little Brother. Yeah. And then I actually had thought, I thought pretty much that I had played out surveillance with look. And I really figured I had explored all there was to explore. But then I thought, well, you know, one aspect of it that I didn't ever um, really explore was somebody being intentionally put under surveillance. And that's when I started to think, well, maybe there's something interesting that could be experimented with there. But what would the framework be? You know, why would somebody be being surveyed so comprehensively? Um, and then I thought, well, could it be a private detective surveying somebody who, you know, somebody's under surveillance um, that they're being hired to watch? Eh, we've seen that before. So I thought, well, reality television could be kind of fun. I mean, the idea of just out and out lampooning reality TV, that wasn't where the idea came from originally. I mean, reality television is already a parody of itself. It doesn't need me to parody it for people to realize that it's, you know, reality television is crazy yeah. but I thought that a reality show producer putting a family under surveillance could get dark very quickly and I thought that could be fun and interesting and in the process I could have some fun making fun of reality TV as well so certainly not much of a fan of reality TV then <laughs> well I can't you know I don't want to be a hypocrite and say <laughs> that you know that I, I hate it because hey I've watched it too you know we all watch it it's just all a part of a part of, you know, the culture right now. Yeah. Everybody loves a trainer, right? So, um, you know, in the same way that it's fun to watch, you know, wrestling every once in a while, I mean, you just know it's faith when you watch it. You know, when you watch these two, you know, housewives of uh, Sheboygan, you know, uh, tackling each other uh, at the, you know, at one of the kids' bar mitzvahs, you know it's staged for the cameras. I mean, and uh, yet, you know, people still watch. I've watched you know, here and there. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I wanted to make fun of. I wanted to have some fun with that. And what's crazy to me is that, you know, having seen the trailer and, you know, the clips of, of your character in the series, um, kind of injecting people into this poor guy's life and this poor family's life just to mess with them uh, for the benefit of, of ratings, as, and as extreme as some of the situations in the show look, it doesn't actually, you know... It, it really isn't that far removed from what happens in, in our own reality because, like you said, you know, we have shows that claim to be real, yet, you know, they're staged to a degree that isn't even worth thinking about. And then that you have things like Big Brother, which are, you know, they're edited in a certain way to make situations look the, the opposite of what, you know, actually happened. Absolutely true, and they all do that. And I, I listen, I don't feel that the concept of my show is all that far-fetched from, from 
becoming a real reality show someday. I could absolutely see a network or a reality show producer deciding that putting people under surveillance without the knowledge is the next level of reality TV and, you know, you know, fucking them to make the show more interesting. I could see people really doing that. I wanted to, I wanted to comment on it due the satire, but I could totally see them doing it for real. Oh yeah, it's like um, you know, sort of when when the Running Man came out, you, you'd never imagined in a million years that that would ever anything close to that would even happen. But now, you know, as extreme as that may be, it's actually compared to back then, it's actually closer to be to you know perhaps one day actually, you know, actually uh, happening. Absolutely, and the, the, my favorite example of this is a movie called Network, which was directed by Sidney Lumet and was written by Patty Chayefsky, and, uh, and it was made in, I think it was 1975 or 1976. Yeah. I know that's very easily uh, researchable. Anyway, it's a, uh, it's a biting, biting satire about television and television news and television ratings, and at the time that it came out, people thought it was outrageous that, that news would actually you know, be competing for ratings, and the news would be being manipulated to you know, entertaining to attract much bigger sponsors, and, and people thought that was nuts. And of course, now, you know, I think that movie is one of the most brilliant movies ever made. But you show that to uh, an audience today, they don't necessarily understand what the big deal of that movie was because all television is like that now. Yeah. The 24 hour news channels are all manipulated for ratings and are sensationalized and, are, you know, uh, you know, vying for. Sponsors and it's uh, everything's manipulated, you know, to be applicable to the to the and slanted to the angle of the the network. That's you know all these kinds of crazy things. So the movie was a real prophecy, and that, I took a lot of inspiration from that movie for, for a reality show. I also took a lot of inspiration from Albert Brooks's film Real Life, which I love as well. Oh right, yeah, absolutely, and I see that. Um you've created your own fake series within re reality show and perhaps scarier than uh, anything we've just discussed. Uh, Stripper Mums of South Beach was one of the fake shows you've created. And, uh, I can actually imagine a show like that airing on um, MTV or something. Absolutely. Real Stripper Mums of South Beach. We actually joked around when we were making the, the series because we make so many fake you know, clips from some reality shows. Real Stripper Mums of South Beach is one of them. Hobover, which is a hobo makeover show. Uh, we do one called The Womanizer, which is sort of like The Bachelor. American Imbecile, which is like American Idol, but people are competing to be the biggest idiot. We were thinking, God, you know, we could probably sell half of these shows. <laughs> I think you could. <laughs> <laughs> so did you draw, uh, when, when you created the character of, of Mickey Wagner, uh, did you kind of m maybe draw inspiration when creating that character of perhaps people that you've met uh, in the industry? Absolutely. I mean, in, I mean, Hollywood is uh, is sort of uh, the Oz of um, amoral um, behavior. Uh, people, people. <laughs> I think this has a higher concentration of uh, genuine psychopaths than just about anywhere else. Maybe Washington D.C. is a close second. But, uh, I mean, there there is more amoral uh, sociopaths. Uh, succeeding in Hollywood than just about anywhere else. And I've known many producers uh, in the TV world, the movie world, agents, uh, managers, that are, it's, it's fascinating to me, the, the character types, uh, because they would not think twice, they would not give it a second thought about, you know, destroying someone's life for the sake of, would it make a better show? Would it get better ratings? Would we make more money? Would we get your sponsors? It's, and it's not that they're immoral. It's not that they're thinking, this is terrible. I'm betraying my moral core, but I'm going to do it to get rich. They're amoral. They just, they just don't have any morality about it whatsoever. And that's what's really kind of creepy about it, you know? Mm. I, uh, there's one story uh, that was part of the inspiration for a reality show. None of this story made it into, the, into my show. But it's a true story, and uh, it got me thinking about people like Wagner. Right. So a friend of mine had been working on a show, a reality show, where they recreate actual 911 calls. I don't know if London has 911. Do you have 911? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, similar, 999 over here. Okay, okay, so same concept. So, so what they would do is they would take a recording of a 911 call, and then they would uh, reenact it uh, while listening to the, the call, and then they'd interview the people involved. And the 911 call involved a horse that had fallen down a, a, like a ravine that needed help getting out, and they brought a helicopter in, strapped the horse to the helicopter, and helicoptered the horse out of the ravine to safety um, on the, on the uh, level land. So in shooting the recreation, the horse fell out of the harness and plummeted hundreds of feet to its death, right? And the producer of the show, a friend told me the story who was working on the crew, the producer of the show raced to every bystander around who was videotaping it with their phone, their video cameras, and paid them all on the spot to all of their footage so that it, so that it wouldn't hurt the show. And then the segment as it aired, of course, is the happy story of the horse being rescued. But the real story is that the horse was tragically killed. He was much more concerned with protecting the show and protecting the ratings and protecting what the concept of the show was than letting the real story out. And that type of behavior is kind of part of the inspiration for Mickey Wagner. And Mickey Wagner is a horrible guy. He's the villain of our story. He He's willing to do whatever it takes to, for his show to succeed, no matter how many people uh, are hurt in the process. That's crazy. And did you always have have yourself in mind to play that character? I did. I always, uh, I always intended to play the part. And you're not. A, a, don't believe you're a, a trained actor, are you? I am not an actor. I, I do not consider myself an actor. Um, I'm not a very good actor. But there's a certain kind of role that I, I feel relatively comfortable playing, and that's sort of a heightened version of myself. So, um, you know, Mickey Wagner is just kind of the, the dark side of me. So <laughs> it was, it was uh, not too big of a stretch uh, to be able to. And what was the the casting process like? I mean, I noticed that you uh, you cast a local theatre actor in Scott Anderson as Dennis, and I believe the series yeah, marks. Yeah, from Chicago. Yeah. Um, we we actually we wanted all unknowns for the roles because we wanted to feel real. Mm. So um, we looked everywhere where you you know where you're hoping that you know undiscovered talent. Uh, are are there working, you know, waiting to be discovered. So we checked local theater, we checked, uh, you know, we asked all the agencies, who do you have that's good, that has never made it, that looking for their break? You know, who are the young up-and-comers that have just come to town? It's easier to find young talent that are undiscovered because they're new to town, they haven't been discovered yet, you know? Um, and the girl who plays... You know, the family's made up of uh, Dennis Warwick, the dad, played by Scott Anderson. And we found Scott. He was a, a theater actor in Chicago who sent us a, a YouTube link of his audition. And he was just so good, he got the We said we sent it in as a lark based on the suggestion of our production designer, who, you know, I, the production designer, Brett Snodgrass, and myself, we went to uh, high school together in Chicago. So he told me, he told me, yeah, I know an actor in Chicago who's really good. Why don't I have to send in an audition? He did an audition, put it on YouTube, sent us the link, and he got cast. We called him up. We said, guess what? You're going to be the lead in the Showtime series. He was blown away. <laughs> um, uh, the woman who plays uh, the mom, the character's name is Catherine Warwick. Her name is Kelly Hensley. She actually, of everybody, had um, a legitimate career. She was on a soap opera called As the World Turns for many, many years. And we said to her, you're too, you're too hot, for one, to be believable as this character. The, this mom needs to be much more frumpy and much less in touch with her sexual side. And, you know, we, we, we fear people may recognize you. And she said, well, let me frumpy up and let me, let me go in disguise and let me transform. And, uh, and, and I promise you, nobody will know it's me. And she was right. She just she put on a wig and glasses and she wardrobe and she gained weight. I mean, she just completely transformed into another character, which was amazing. And then uh, Amy, the daughter, is played by Monica Tilding, 
and she, like I was saying, is one of the, the young talent in LA. You know, they, they come they come in they come to town in busloads, and uh, the good ones get discovered real quick. And we got real lucky in that we discovered Monica real quick because she's definitely going to be a star. And then all the rest of the cast, <laughs> it took months to cast because you know to find really good people. Yeah, it's tough. So we, but we found all really good people. We got really lucky. I think it's a, an excellent decision to to cast unknowns because, uh, like you said, I think it it um, boosts the element of realism. And I mean, I guess like a horror film in a way, something is taken away from um, the unpredictability. I think if you have you know famous faces as the protagonists, absolutely, I completely agree. So, how do you find working in television differs from making films? Um. Pretty different, although my personal experience with television is different than a lot of other people's experience with television because my uh, look at series and reality show are both very, um, the process was very much like making a film at times. Uh, I was given the same freedom that I'm given when I'm making an independent film um, because we you know, our agreement with Showtime is if you can bring it in for a, a low budget, in exchange, we'll give you creative control. And to me, that's all of the worthwhile exchange. Yeah. You know, television generally, especially as it gets bigger and more expensive, and, you know, television episodes are very expensive. For, you know, because of Dexter, our three and a half, four million dollars an episode. You know what I mean? Mm. Our whole season is a fraction of the cost of one episode of Dexter. You know what I mean? So, um... The, you know, the more money that's spent on a show like that and the more money that's spent on advertising a show like that, and then you start getting into, you know, that's Showtime. You start getting into network shows like, you know, uh, NBC shows and CBS shows, even bigger money, bigger PR budgets. Lots of, lots of cooks are in that kitchen, you know, and it becomes a much more collaborative process. Um, but my two experiences making these two series is very much mirrored my experiences making independent films, which has been great, really creatively fulfilling. Um, I'd love to do bigger television shows. It's just a different process, you know? Yeah. And I love to do big movies, and, and I've written a lot of very big studio movies, and those are much more collaborative as well, which is great, and I love the process. It's just different. You know, when you make a small independent film, it's, it's a single, it's, just, it's more of a singular voice than when you start getting into giant films with know many 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 millions of dollars at stake well certainly no one could accuse you of uh making the same thing over and over because uh i mean you really have <laughs> dabbled in just about everything i mean I'm, I'm sure many people would never assume that the guy who wrote mouse hunt also uh made wadzilla but that's a good thing <laughs> thank you listen uh, creatively speaking it's been fantastic and i've been very lucky that i get to do all kinds of different things Professionally speaking, it's been a, a bit of a liability because Hollywood loves to pigeonhole people. Yeah. They love to know that, oh, he's the guy that does horror films or he's the guy that does gangster movies or he's the guy that does gross-out comedies. And they just like to see you in one light. And then if you're if you're that go-to guy for, every, you know, anytime they need a, a, a new horror film they think of you to go to, you, you know, you can succeed very quickly. I like to tell all kinds of stories. I like big stories, small stories, serious stories, funny stories, and I have to, I have to go wherever my inspiration takes me. And like I said, that professionally can sometimes be a challenge, but I wouldn't have it any other way. And I've been lucky that I've gotten to do all the things that I've wanted to do so far. But there's a lot more that I still hope that I get to do. If you love what you do, and you do it because, um, you know, because your passion. Um, demands it. It, it. It's not a job. I mean, you, I I can't. I don't think I've ever worked a day in my life because I love what I do so much. I can't ever, in good conscience, call it work. You know. <laughs> but if I was just cranking out sausages, you know, um, just because that's what I know would pay the bills, and that sausage happens to be a tried and true genre that I have come to, you know, uh, to be relied upon to crank out. But, it, but my heart's not in it, but it's a good paying gig, that wouldn't be me, you know? Yeah. So what's next for you? I am about to start on my passion 
project of all time. My, my biggest passion movie so far to date. I can't tell you what it is yet, uh, but I certainly will very, very soon. I'll tell you this. It's, it's a film. It's a drama. It's, uh, it's going to break people's hearts. And, uh, I, and it is a love letter to movies. But beyond that, I can't say another word. Excellent. Well, it's certainly uh, intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I think that about does it. I uh, really appreciate your time uh, this morning for you, Adam. Absolutely, Adam. 